not the biggest, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and closest to the tech and uh, the hosting company. I, I do sit on uh, part of the hosting company, but looks like we didn't really uh, think this through uh, and gave enough of uh, directions and instructions to people. But uh, with apologies, I think we can start uh, running a little late, uh, but uh, I think it's going to be interesting and slightly different, um, you know, color discussion than uh, some of the other sessions uh, where in this session, I think we're um, sort of talking about more traditional set of problems that uh, you know, different people have been, uh, you know, re, um, you know, discovering after the pandemic and uh, the sort of re-emergence of different markets and uh, a lot of deals that, uh, um, you know, mimic what was happening before the pandemic and uh, with the help of technology and um, like government subsidy and other funding uh, restrictions uh, have seen different sort of developments and colors uh, panning out the past uh, couple years. So uh, today uh, we want to talk about uh, you know, key recurring themes and issues in offshore litigation context. And uh, by offshore, I think we're defining a little broadly than usual to cover not just the typical offshore um, of you know, Cayman and BBI jurisdictions that uh, people think about, but also, uh, you know, within the state, uh, you know, we want to talk about a little bit on Delaware, and also on the investing side, we will pick an example out of Korea to, you know, talk about the different aspects or different dynamics that go on on the investor side, so that we have a little more uh, broader sketch of issues and uh, things that go on in investment structure, especially fund structure. So, um, nice to meet you all. I'm Robin Beck. I'm a partner at uh, Corbin Kim based in Seoul. Uh, I, you know, by design and structure, we only do disputes work, uh, disputes and investigation work, uh, and do a lot of offshore litigation as well. Offshore, again, defined quite broadly to cover Hong Kong, um, BBI, Cayman, Delaware, and other parts of the world, as well as uh, New York and uh, other more central financial districts as well. Um, to uh, my right, uh, we, we have three guests. Uh, first, uh, I wanna introduce all of them to you, and then uh, we'll take turns in terms of uh, covering the substantive points. So first, uh, Mike Maxwell is partner at uh, Potter Anderson in Delaware uh, in the States. Uh, he advises clients on matters of Delaware corporate and business law and transactions involving Delaware alternate uh, entities and corporations, including investment and private equity fund transactions, uh, bond formations, joint ventures, cross-border transactions, mergers, acquisitions, asset sales, and purchases. Uh, dissolution uh, and restructuring. Uh, he also represents both lenders and borrowers in a variety of commercial financing transactions, including asset-based financing, real estate, mortgage financing, and other credit-related transactions. Uh, he advises uh, management boards of special committees of Delaware entities on matters operation, uh, matters of operation and governance, including uh, with respect to fiduciary duty and contractual interpretation issues. Um, he, uh, among the panels, he's more on the sort of Delaware transactional side, and uh, we invited him, I invited him to be on the panel today to share a broader sort of, um, you know, perspective on how to think about these from transactional perspective as well as uh, disputes perspective. Uh, towards the, uh, when, when the problem actually arises. And then next to him, uh, Helen Wong uh, from Kerry Olson in Singapore. Uh, she focuses her practice on litigation, insolvency, and restructuring in Singapore. 
He specializes in complex commercial litigation, shareholder disputes, uh, estate and private clients relations uh, related disputes, uh, fraud and investigatory cases, and insolvency and restructuring matters. Um, Helen has extensive experience advising clients on cross-border litigation and handling high-value disputes covering a broad range of sectors, including banking and financial services, energy and resources, insurance, and high net worth individuals. So today, uh, we'll uh, ask her to cover key offshore jurisdictions among um, Ma'al, Cayman, and, and uh, get her view in terms of the recent developments in Cayman law uh, when it comes to fund uh, litigation, especially um, redemption issues or information access issues. And then uh, towards the end, uh, JY Jinyang uh, Chang from Kim and Chan uh, from here, uh, Seoul. Uh, JY focuses his practice on international arbitration and cross border litigation practice and insolvency and restructuring. Um, JY has successfully represented a variety of various uh, foreign and Korean clients in numerous uh, contentious disputes. He has represented clients in a wide range of disputes involving financial products, derivatives, corporate matters, M&A, and competition, among others. In particular, his uh, advocacy of a foreign investor in an ICC arbitration proceeding against the uh, Governmental Deposit Insurance Corporation uh, led to an award of approximately 3 trillion uh, Korean won, which is approximately 2.5 billion US, uh, which is one of the largest arbitral awards in Korean history. He has also advised many of the world's largest corporations, creditors, as well as investors on various insolvency and corporate restructuring related matters in South Korea. So uh, today, we'll be asking him to cover a bit of uh, investor side, structural issues that's a little more uh, idiosyncratic or, or special to Korean fund structure. So with that, um, let me uh, start by just sharing a little bit of basics in uh, terms of um, fund structure that we talk about in offshore uh, jurisdictions and offshore litigation. Uh, I think this is sort of basic for a lot of fund formation and uh, uh, you know disputes lawyers uh, working in offshore litigation uh, scenarios. Um, and essentially, there there are for tax reasons there there's a parallel structure. One coming through for U.S. Uh, taxable investors uh, through Delaware entities, whether it's LLC or corporation or partnership, um, typical LLC. Uh, I would, you know, uh, I understand. Uh, and the other side would be for U.S. Uh, non-taxable, tax-exempt U.S. investors and uh, non-U.S. investors who are not subject to, otherwise not subject to U.S. taxation, uh, and they would have. Uh, parallel the, uh, vehicles to go into um, the ultimate sort of investment, uh, target investment. And they will be covered by the same individuals, typically based in uh, one of the financial hubs in, in New York or London, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Seoul. And they would have. Um, have, have the GP position for these entities, especially if there are partnerships uh, and um, a sponsor uh, the, and, and set up the structure uh, for investors. And then they would have um, the investment management company that uh, manages the investments and makes investment decisions and also reports back uh, to the funds and ultimately to the investors on performance of the investments and uh, deals with um, investment related decisions. I think because we don't have two years, I'm sorry, uh, we'll, we'll uh, you know, I think once we get to the actual substantive discussion point, I think we can, um, I'll try to uh, use as, you know, 
little number of slides as possible and, and try to stay in my uh, seat. But I uh, wanted to cover typical uh, sort of re recurring themes in disputes in offshore litigation context, where general manager, the, the uh, general partner or uh, investment managers, they go missing in action. So typically they don't respond to calls, they don't uh, return your emails, or um, just, you know, they, they just disappear. Uh, not enough information about the, the, these are separate, but they can occur at the same time. Sometimes they uh, have the same source of problem, uh, but you know, in certain cases, not enough information about the underlying investment in terms of structure, performance, timeline uh, of redemption, things of that sort. Um, redemption procedure when uh, investor or LPs in these uh, situations um, try to redeem their shares or interests in the partnership. Uh, procedure is halt for no good reason, and there's no, again, no response. Uh, one side of documentation that does not provide sufficient protection to the investors because typically the documentation is driven by the GPs and uh, investment managers we actually set up these uh, investment vehicles. I think lately, uh, especially with uh, bigger LPs and more um, sort of sophisticated players in the market, there has been some push against that, and like there are a uh, sufficient number of side letters and their enforceability in different jurisdictions, but uh, uh, for some of the more uh, you know, progressive, riskier uh, portfolios, I think these are still the recurring themes uh, throughout the uh, litigation. And then uh, the key sort of concerns or action items for investors or their counsel um, are, you know, again, th these are recurring themes. Uh, so first of all, like, where's my money? And uh, how, how is it invested? How is it performing? Like, if it's under, especially because a lot of these uh, target investments are not liquid and not uh, sort of easily, um, you know, redeemable, the actual, uh, you know, place of the funds investment sitting in different jurisdictions uh, does matter a lot to uh, ultimate investors and their uh, manager, investment managers who are making the decisions to invest through these vehicles. And then there's a standing issue, I think we're gonna talk a little bit more, uh, more about this when JY uh, takes money, because the, the because of the different layers of uh, corporate structure, there is always standing issues uh, in terms of, okay, it's I'm the beneficial holder or beneficial investor in this uh, fund, but I don't necessarily have the pre, uh, you know, contractual preview with the fund itself or general manager himself or herself. So there's an issue with standing, legal standing to bring suit in Cayman, in New York, in Delaware, wherever that is. And then there's a redemption processes and uh, related challenges where, uh, again, like because the documentation is um, one-sided and very, um, you know, general partner friendly or, or sponsor friendly, uh, it's not always clear exactly when you can redeem and how long it's going to take and what the process is for redemption, the valuation for redemption, and things of that sort. And then if you're, uh, you know, the dominant player or a dominant investor in this particular structure, uh, is there a way to wind up the uh, entity? Like, is there a way to dis dissolve the entity to get whatever is left and or uh, just take over the underlying investment yourself? So these uh, things, uh, especially in Cayman, uh, but also in Delaware and um, Korea, is, uh, you know, key points. And we're going to come back to these points uh, again and again. But with that, I think, uh, you know, I'll invite um, Helen to start uh, the Cayman side of uh, discussion.
Sure, you can you can <laughs> 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 Rich, um, I'm standing here because you just want to get close to the, uh, to the control of the slides. Um, but I will take the next 10 to 15 minutes or so try to explain the uh, payment perspective of funds related disputes. So my area of practice is uh, in offshore litigation. So I cover payment BPI and Bermuda. Um, amongst these three jurisdictions, payment is the most popular uh, jurisdiction for uh, fund setup. So in recent years, we have seen a lot of uh, actions or disputes between uh, limited partners and general partners uh, in a typical extended limited partnership structure. Uh, I'm just curious who in the audience has actually come across an extended limited partnership or in Cayman Island. No one, okay. Then it's probably <laughs> worthwhile for me to explain a little bit what that is. So it's um, uh, basically a vehicle created by statutory provisions. So you have this idea of exempted limited partnership, um, which is an entity without a separate legal personality. Um, you have the uh, limited partners on top, basically your passive investors who's putting their money in. Uh, then you have the general partners who's uh, a bit like investment manager or, or director in the, in the traditional company role, right? They control all the assets, uh, they have the management power, and they hold all the assets uh, of this fund on trust for the limited partner. So that's a, a very simplified version of what a extended limited partnership in Cayman is about. Um, so uh, the recent years, we have seen a lot of case developments in, in a number of issues. Um, uh, basically on information assets, uh, standing issues, uh, how do you uh, redeem uh, your investment and, and get your money back through winding up process. I'm going to start uh, with the um, uh, access to information first. Because whenever you start a dispute, the first thing you want is that let's collect the evidence, see what's going on uh, with this fund. Um, uh, so we have quite a wide uh, statutory power under the Exempted Limited Partnership Act, um, which provides that um, the limited partner may demand and shall receive from the general partner true and full information regarding the state of business and financial information of the Exempted uh, Limited Partnership. All sounds very well, except that you have this proviso which says um, it's subject to any express or implied term in a partnership agreement. So you can imagine uh, when a limited partner uh, waves around this section 22 rights and, and say, general partner, please give me the information. Um, usually the reaction in, by the general partner is that actually we have something in the limited partnership agreement uh, which may have limited or excluded uh, this statutory right so we have some uh, recent cases on how the court tried to construe these provisions. Um, so I'm giving you two examples. Uh, the first one is this uh, Dorsey Ventures case. Um, so the limited partner um, was trying to get information on exactly what Robin has mentioned before. Where did my money go? As simple as that. Like, what happened to the money I already put into this fund? Um, and then the general partner point to this provision. It's one of the uh, many express provisions that um, touch upon this issue, but I try to extract uh, the most relevant one for your information. So the general partner said, oh, no, 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 you have already given up your statutory right uh, because under the LPA, uh, we say we are going to provide you with uh, audited uh, accounts every year, and that's the only thing you are entitled to. Impliedly, we have already excluded your wider statutory access to information. Uh, but fortunately, the, the court takes a different view and say, uh, look at the language of these terms. There's nothing uh, which is inconsistent uh, with the uh, statutory uh, right to access information. So you cannot, by this sort of term, just uh, say we have already impliedly excluded uh, statutory rights. But at least this is the first warning. You have to be careful 
uh, as an LP, don't inadvertently give up your statutory right to access information. Um, then moving on to our second case. Second case is a more recent one because it just happened uh, this year. Um, so uh, this concerned uh, a fund uh, that's called um, uh, Neoma Private Equity Fund for LP. Um, so this is an investment fund uh, that forms part of the Ara group. And Ara used to be quite a big uh, private equity fund in the Middle East. Uh, unfortunately, it was caught in this allegation of fraud and mismanagement, and the entire Arab group basically went down, went to li liquidation. So it included a holding company, it included uh, the primary investment manager, and it included a GP of this accepted limited partnership as well. Um, so as part of the liquidation process, actually a new investment manager came in uh, by buying the management rights, and their task is first to assess this capital uh, account balance of each LP. Uh, then they can subsequently wind up the funds and, and distribute uh, the, the assets that still remain the fund according to the capital account balance of each LP. Uh, sounds like a simple task, but turns out to be not that simple after all. Uh, because they work out their own calculation of this capital account balance, and they already view that some LP is going to dispute the amount they have calculated. So they went to the court and asked for a court declaration. Can you confirm that my calculation is correct? Um, I, I've already done everything I can. Yeah. Uh, but the LP, of course, turned around and started counterclaiming this proceeding, saying, no, 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 I'm not. Oh, something is flashing on screen. OK. <laughs> um, um, so uh, the LP turn around and say, actually, I, I want to exercise my Section 22 rights and get access to information. Um, I'm feeling a bit sympathetic to the GP in this scenario. Just remember, they, they come into this so fund in, in the middle of the liquidation process. Uh, the fund is already being accused of doing some fraud and mismanagement. So actually, the, the new investment manager who came in didn't have the full picture of information. And they were trying to say, um, actually, there were only a few limited partnerships who uh, exercising this right. And it wouldn't be quite proportionate for uh, us to spend all this money and time and, and try to, to collect all the information they want. So there is some a proportionality argument going on there. But when you went to court, uh, the court say, sorry, proportionality argument is not a defense to our section 22. Uh, and the court also gave some very helpful guidance as to the, the scope of documents uh, that an LP can obtain under this provision. So that basically includes all materials and advice produced by the manager and paid for by the partnership should in principle be made available to the LP. Yeah. So basically everything um, the, the investment manager uh, has got as documents, working papers, reports and minutes. If they got their own data to, to do the valuation, their own data set as well, um, as well as any document um, the general partners or, or the investment manager relied on to establish the rights of the LP. Uh, the court is aware that uh, in this particular case, there are quite a lot of missing documents. But the court say, okay, if you cannot find the documents, you still have to explain the effort uh, you have made uh, to try to locate them uh, and explain why it is not quite possible to retrieve the relevant information. Um, so I would say Section 22 is actually quite a, a wide power given to the LP for access of information. Okay, um, having collected the information, um, if we are asking for LP, then you start thinking about who should I go after to get my money back? Right. Um, so the next step is probably to think about what's the. Oh. Uh, I know I touched the wrong button. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 
Right. So the next question is to think about what sort of claim that LP can bring. Uh, and uh, our statutory provision, uh, unfortunately, has given rise to some uh, confusion. Uh, but that has been explained by subsequent case law. I will show you the, uh, the provision that has caused confusion. That's basically our section uh, 33. And you will see that um, it says the legal proceeding by or against an uh, exempted limited partnership uh, may be bought uh, by or against any one or more of the general partner only. Okay. It's the word only. Uh, that seems to suggest uh, if you want to uh, sue or uh, uh, if an exempted limited partnership has to be sued, it has to be against the, the LP, well, it has to be against the GP or by the GP. Um, there is an exception provided in subsection 3, uh, which say the limited partner may bring an action on behalf of the uh, ELP if any one or more of the GP would offer to do so without cause failed or refused to institute proceedings. So there is a question of how this statutory provision actually operates in practice. Does that mean LP actually cannot sue? Um, so we have a very recent decision on this, the Kuwait uh, court case. Um, <clears throat> so it's helpful maybe I explain uh, a little bit about the background of this case. Um, um, so in this case, the, the, the fund itself has one GP and 11 LP. And two of the LPs have started uh, their proceedings. Uh, they went after GP, who is the obvious candidate. Um, they went after the GP's uh, 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 founder, uh, who is the individual in control of the GP. Uh, they went after third party as well. Uh, who they say was involved in entering related transactions with the GP and misappropriated its funds. Uh, so they, they basically targeted everyone uh, who they say had some uh, role to play in misappropriating the funds assets. And, and try to structure the claim uh, in two different ways. The first one is a direct claim uh, based on laws suffered by the LP itself. Uh, and a direct claim is uh, made against uh, both the uh, GP and the third parties I mentioned just now. And the second type of claim is derivative claim. A derivative claim that means it's brought on behalf of the ELP, uh, trying to cover, uh, recover the losses suffered by the ELP as a whole. So the court was looking at these two different types of claims and came to the view that Actually, Section 33, uh, the, the statute provision I read out just now, has no operation in the direct claim context. Uh, it is only relevant when it comes to a derivative claim uh, that we have to look at the provision of Section 33. Um, and it also says that LP can actually bring a derivative claim without the leave of the court. So the process is that the LP can commence proceedings by way of a derivative claim and come to the court directly without applying for a leave in advance. But once they come to the court, they have to explain to the court how they satisfy the, uh, the condition under subsection 3 just now. That's the LP without any cause fail to bring the proceedings against the third party. Uh, but in this case, uh, the court say, First of, all, well, uh, first of all, this is already a court of appeal decision. At the first instance, the judge already found that the ELP itself didn't suffer any losses. Um, so since the ELP didn't suffer loss, then there's no basis for bringing a derivative claim. Uh, and secondly, uh, there's already an alternative relief, which is by way of the direct claim against GP. Uh, but the court say, and so far as the actions against the third parties are concerned, um, the GP have put itself in a conflict of interest position because they have no incentive to sue the third party who might have entered into a related uh, transaction with them. So on that basis, the condition under subsection 3 is actually satisfied. And um, the LP are allowed to bring derivative claim against uh, the third parties. Uh, so I'm moving on to uh, my last slide uh, already and just want to 
uh, cover uh, the, the, the last resort uh, in exiting uh, your investment. It's basically to wind up um, the, the ELP. So I'm not talking about uh, a non-contentious situation where um, you have the, all the vote of uh, GP and say two-thirds of the vote of LP that you try to voluntarily wind up. But I'm talking about a more contentious situation uh, where uh, the parties are not in agreement. Um, then first of all, there is the question of whether you can commence writing a proceedings based on... Um, oh, that's me again. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's going all the way up. Stop. Okay. Come down. Sorry. All right, back to normal. <laughs> The first question is whether you can commence winding up proceedings uh, based on a paid redemption proceeds. Um, so we have this Privy Council case, um, Paris uh, global, global case. Uh, like, technically speaking, it's not really an ELP related case, um, but it's a case re in relation to a company that's registered as a mutual fund in Cayman Island. And you can see in this sort of cases, the director tried all sorts of things and run all sorts of arguments. Um, so what happened is the shareholder already exercised their redemption right by issuing the redemption notice. Uh, but under the articles, the director has the right to suspend the redemption. Uh, so they say, now I'm exercising uh, our suspension right, and that should operate retrospectively to stop whoever that has already issued a redemption notice uh, from commencing proceedings. Uh, of course, the Privy Council uh, uh, wasn't uh, agreeable to that kind of intro, uh, in, in interpretation uh, and takes the view that you cannot have retrospective effect uh, for the subs uh, suspension right to operate. Whoever that has already exercised their redemption right can commence winding up proceedings uh, on the basis of unpaid redemption right. So that is at least good news uh, for LPs who are trying to recover their redemption right. Um, but that's not the end of the matter, because as a creditor, if you are claiming your redemption money as a creditor in Cayman Island, there are, there are other difficulties as well. We have an unhelpful case called uh, the Pat Fund, in which a creditor started winding up proceedings against the ELP. But of course, they actually have named the wrong party. When you sue an ELP, you should name the GP as the respondent as well. Uh, theoretically, it sounds all right because we say, oh, the GP holds the assets on behalf of the LP uh, and the ELP itself doesn't have a separate legal personality. But in practice, it doesn't work uh, for various reasons. Uh, first of all, your, your general partner may not be a Cayman entity. It could be a Delaware entity, right? Uh, you can have more than one general partner. Uh, you can have one general partner uh, acting as a general partner for more than one fund as well. So how can you wind up an ELP by suing the general partner? Um, so that has caused a lot of practical difficulty. Um, what is slightly clearer is if you as an LP started just an equitable winding up proceedings, then we have a subsequent case that confirms that uh, you can do so against the ELP directly by uh, naming the ELP as a respondent. Uh, so now I would say uh, just an equitable winding up, uh, the LPs are more or less safe to just name the ELP. If you are doing winding up as a creditor, not so sure yet. Uh, we still have to wait for the next case law to confirm the position. So that's basically everything on the Cayman part. I will move on uh, to Mike to discuss the Delaware part. <laughs> All right, so Delaware's a little different than the, the ELPs. Uh, so Delaware Limited Partnerships, a lot of times are they are separate legal entities. Uh, and so there's there's a little difference in the treatment. So today I just want to talk about uh, Alright. 
So a couple things. Uh, you know, recent Delaware cases have talked about um, if you were investing in a Delaware limited partnership or, or an LLC, and, I, and I'll use those terms a little bit interchangeably because uh, the statutes are very similar. Um, the primary difference being that a Delaware limited partnership like an exempted limited partnership as a general partner, typically limited partners that are passive investors, whereas a, an LLC just has members. And you can have a manager, you can have member managers, you know, you know, board of managers, there's a number of different ways that you can structure that. But the a recent Delaware case essentially said that if you are going to invest in Delaware alternative entities, these LLCs, limited partnerships, and the caveat enter is the buzzword there. Um, buyer beware, because these are creatures of contract, the typical protections that you might find in the Delaware Corporation, the statutory overlay, are quite different in these alternative entities. And so, just wanted to briefly, I guess, cover some of the uh, the, the unique aspects of, about these, these Delaware entities, as well as talk a little bit about why, why so many companies incorporate and use Delaware. So, you know, think about the chart that Robin had up earlier. If we're on the U.S. side, we're coming in. You typically have a, a fund structure. Uh, it's an LLC or a limited partnership, uh, a general partner or an investment manager or manager of the it's an LLC. And uh, and, the, and the reason you know these are structured in Delaware so often, at least if you're in, in doing U.S. investments, is uh, Delaware has. Um, a unique position in, in the United States where these are, uh, you know, the, the, the idea is they're creatures of contracts. There's very few, um, very few default rules. And so those default rules are really, you know, and, and, and even if there are default rules under the statute, a lot of times those default rules can be varied by the partnership agreement. So, it really is the partnership agreements that control the the governance of these these entities. And so, for example, um, you know, to the extent that you're one of the things, so freedom of contract, maximum enforceability of the partnership agreement, or policies in the statutes themselves, um, indemnification. For example, uh, in the DGCL, indemnification is statutorily provided. For corporations. So if you're a director or an officer of a corporation, there's certain mandatory identification and advancement rights that you're going to have. In an LLC or a limited partnership, that's not the case. The, the power is there to provide for indemnity and advancement, but it is not guaranteed. Um, so you have to contractually provide for that. So I guess just backing up a little bit, talking about why why Delaware, why, why these entities use Delaware. Um, you know, the, the, so on the statutory side, you know, talking about the, the statutory basis for, for these entities, the, the statutes are regularly, regularly updated. Um, and we'll talk about one of the cases here a little bit on the information access rights where that was in direct, the, the statute was updated in, in direct response to a, a case that came out a little bit different than most practitioners expected. Uh, the other thing is the, the access to the, the Delaware state courts. And so um, just keep in mind if you're investing in the US, there's the, the federal overlay of you know the, the SEC, the Investment Company Act, there's a number of federal regulations that uh, may come into play as far as investing in, in these funds. And then there's the, the state law. And, and the state law you know, can have just as much importance. I think in one of the earlier sessions we had today about litigation, the point was made that it depends on the jurisdiction where you are in the United States as to what kind of uh, court and, and proceedings that you're going to end up in. And so in Delaware, one of the main things we have is the Delaware Chancery Court, which is essentially like a business court. And, and instead of juries, you have chancellors, or a chancellor and vice chancellors, and uh, magistrate judges that are appointed by the, the governor. There's a, used to be a, a political neutrality type requirement where you had to have relative balance from each political party for the appointment of different judges. That was struck out of the, struck down as unconstitutional, but I think the, the policy is still continuing to be applied. And so you have these 
judges that are taken from the Delaware Bar are typically very savvy. Uh, they know the Delaware entities, Delaware businesses, they know these disputes. And so these are the people that are deciding that. But keep in mind that for a chance report, that's a court of equity only. So what that means is if it's a uh, injunctive relief, temporary restraining or growing injunction, those types of equitable claims, then that gives you a hook. Or, or if it's statutorily provided under the statutes, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, then you have access to the chance report. But if it's just a pure contract dispute dealing with monetary damages, then you may not have access to the chance report. You have to go into the, what's called the Delaware Superior Court. And that is a uh, court of both law and equity, which is more traditionally what you find in the rest of the United States. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, there is a complex commercial litigation section of the, the Superior Court. So you can still get, you know, savvy judges and, and not necessarily in front of a jury. But, you know, there is a difference in, in that court versus the Chancery Court. Um, the other point I want to make just quickly on, on the fund aspect, you know, we talked about redemption rights in the, the ELP situation. In Delaware, you know, these funds are structured, depends on what type of fund you're, you're dealing with and what the partnership agreements say. And so typically, for example, a private equity fund where you're you know, invested for 10 years and, and you're essentially locked in and you don't get redemption until you know, some kind of event. It, it, you know, usually there's a, a limit on the, you know, on the fund itself and how long it can go. And you know, there's certain things you can do at the end of end of the life of the fund, but a lot of times, um, you know, you're locked in. Now, a hedge fund, you may have more fluid redemption rates that you can take uh, your money and, and subject to certain you know, actions that the GP may take, such as dating and, and things like that, to prevent you from being able to redeem those rights. You typically have a little more um, fluid and, and immediate access to your, to your cash. So going back to that point, where's the money? Depends on what type of fund you've invested in, at least in the U.S. ones. Uh, so, another another point I just want to make real quick on on the uh, on the Delaware aspect is that that's critical in thinking about you know before you invest in these entities or understanding these entities is that uh, you can uh, eliminate or modify fiduciary duties, but you can wholesale eliminate fiduciary duties, and that's that's a can be a very big deal, especially if you don't have a majority position, if you don't have a lot of leverage, you don't want to be stuck in a position where your, your rights and remedies are going to be relatively limited because you don't have access or, or the ability to sue for breach of fiduciary duties. Um, now, that said, I think because of that, a lot of, a lot of investors are savvy enough that they will typically not invest in a fund that has a wholesale obligation of fiduciary duties. And a lot of times we see more of a kind of middle ground, and we'll talk about that a little bit. A little bit. Um, so use of Delaware entities gives you access to the Delaware courts in most instances. Um, that also gives the rights of uh, investors to bring a suit in Delaware, uh, statutorily it's provided. Um, also, for example, managers and officers of an LLC um, who materially participate in the business of the LLC, the management of the LLC, can be subject to suit even if they're not named as a manager of the LLC. So, so there's some ways to grab, get jurisdiction over, over those entities. Um, so similar to, to what Helen was talking about, you know, one of the first things you do if you've got a dispute, you've got a situation where you're dealing with, um, the investors that are, uh, you know, where's my money? What's the state of affairs in the, in the fund? You're going to typically start with, you know, trying to get information rights. And so, uh, under Delaware law, you have uh, section 17305 or 18305, depending on if you're a limited partnership or an LLC, and that gives you statutory access to certain things. Uh, but there's certain limitations on that. So it has to be for any purpose reasonably related to the limited partner's interest, the limited partner. And it can be subject to certain restrictions or standards as set forth in the partnership agreement. Um, but to the extent that, you know, 
that those are provided or, or not restricted because there is, you know, later in the statute, there's an ability for you to wholesale restrict access to, to information. Um, you have this list of, of items in the statute, I won't name all of them, but, you know, it's a current list of name and last known business residents or mailing address of each partner. Um, true and full information regarding the amount of cash, the description, the statement of the agreed value of any other property or service contributed by each partner, which each partner has agreed to contribute and data on which they became a partner. Uh, information on the financial condition, full information on the status of business and financial condition of the partnership. And then there's a catch-all that says other information regarding the affairs of limited partnership as is just and reasonable. Uh, so context specific, but there's there's broad statutory rights for you to get access to information from the limited partnership. Now, with that said, there's also rights for a general partner that has wide latitude to determine what type of information they're obligated to deliver. Uh, they can essentially keep information confidential if they believe it's in the best interest or not in the best interest of the partnership to dispose certain things or if they're required by a third party to keep certain things uh, confidential. The other thing I'll, I'll point out here is that this can also be modified by the partnership agreement. So again, buyer be fair, right? You're investing these types of entities, you've got to understand what's in the partnership agreement because in Delaware at least that maximum enforceability of freedom of contract principles are going to really dictate what's what rights you may or may not have. Um, so, a couple of things to think about. Do the contracts, or the rights under the, under the partnership agreement, do they supplement or supplant or override Section 305? Um, if not, you know, the, the good news there is you may have the right to um, both under 305 as a matter of the statute, or if they provide for contractual rights. In fact, there's some case law that says uh, the court found that you're not subject to the usual statutory limitations on requesting books and records that you might be under the statute if there's a contractual right that just expressly gives you that contractual right. It just expressly provides it. Um, and another thing that I know Rob mentioned earlier was side letter rights, right? So a lot of times we'll see investors that if you have the negotiating leverage, you can get uh, separate side letters that provide you certain information, additional information rights, maybe then what's in the, the partnership agreement. Um, and then I guess just quickly on the, the process for you know requesting books and records, usually you can make a request if by the general partner of the partnership, LLC, whatever it may be, it has five days to respond. And if that's not responded to in five days, then they can file an action in court. And it's a summary action. So uh, Meaning that it's it's typically you know it's not a full trial it's not a full litigation and, and a lot of times you end up fighting about the scope of what the post records need to be produced should be. Um, there was a, a recent case a couple of years ago. And this is what I alluded to earlier. Is uh, there's this test of necessary and essential. So even though you may have a proper purpose for bringing books and records request, there's typically still has to be a, a nexus to why you're bringing that request why it's relevant to, to what your stated purpose is. And so it has to be necessary and essential to achieving that purpose. And this is similar to what's under the Books and Records Section 220 in the DPCL. Uh, up until recently, everybody assumed that was the case also in, in these alternative entities. And uh, in, a, in a recent case, the Murphy case, um, Maybe an update on that. <laughs> Anyways, just it, it, quickly, the, the Murphy case, essentially the Supreme Court, it went to the Supreme Court and they said there's not a necessary and essential test uh, unless it's provided in the partnership agreement. And so those in the, the, the Delaware Bar and everybody that was typically used to doing these types of things said, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, we've always assumed. And then the Chancery Court actually found it necessary and essential. So the Supreme Court reversed and said that's not the case. So what did we do? We amended the statute and provided that there has to be a necessary section. Now you can also again modify that by the partnership or the operating agreement, but it is a uh, it is now a, a, one of the things that's required under the under the statute when you think about motion records. Uh, the other thing, just 
touch on a few more points on information access is you gotta check parts agreement on amending or, or expanding or restrictive rights. So again, you can have a, just a straight out contractual ability to get books and records, but then it may be narrowly restricted to what whatever the terms of the contract say. Um, but you may also, if it doesn't supplant or override 305, you may also have to pay under 305 subject to those various improper purpose necessary exceptions. Uh, the other thing is theory books, so sometimes you, you know, you're sitting on a fund structure in one department of the fund and there's a number of portfolio companies and it, can you get the books and records of those subsidiaries? And, and there's a case law that not exactly clear, but a lot of times if it's a wholly owned subsidiary that the, the uh, limited partnership or the LLC has total control over, then you're going to be able to get those that information down the chain in the structure. So just quickly moving through this, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the access to the Delaware reports, preliminary injunction or temporary restraining order. Those are, are remedies that are pretty tough to get because you've got to show immediate irreparable harm if the injunction is not granted. And, um, Damage to the plaintiff does not uh, exceed the damage to the defendants if the injunction does issue. And, and so those can be tough standards, but you know, here the only the only thing I, I wanted to mention is additionally is you know one of the things that really makes Delaware a, a, a you know, go-to jurisdiction for forming these, these entities, including you know, Delaware corporations, is the access to the courts. And part of that is because you can, you know. Even though preliminary injunction may be tough to get, you know, you can do expedited litigation. Um, you can usually do very quick turnaround so you can get to a trial on a, uh, you know, a TRO or, or other types of um, litigation and fairly quickly. Sometimes my litigators tell me within six months. Again, I'm a transactional guy, so I'm not going to pretend to know all the litigation stuff, but I do a lot of litigation adjacent work where I work with our, our litigators on these types of disputes and figuring out what types of claims or what defenses to claims we can have. Um, the other thing is there's a number of summary proceedings. So the books and records, uh, there's an 18.110 or 17.110 uh, action which is control of the partnership or the LLC and enforceability of the partnership or LLC. Because those are statutory that provided uh, access to the chance report to resolve those disputes. And those are summary proceedings, meaning that they can be handled very quickly um, declaratory judgment type, type actions. Um, so finally, just on, on the Delaware corporate measures, a couple of points here that are, are, are worth mentioning as, we, as you're anticipating or figuring out what kind of actions you might be able to bring against a, a non-responsive uh, manager or a general partner is one, removal rights. Uh, in the statutes in Delaware, you can't remove a general partner or manager unless it provides for it. the partnership or the other company. So if you're advising the investors that are about to make investments, you want to make sure that that kind of stuff is addressed. Typically, you'll see something for, you know, the right for removal, removal for cause. And so then you got to think, well, what are the standards for removal for cause? How is cause defined? Uh, what are the who determines that and what basis do you have the right to? So, some critical questions as you're thinking of that. Uh, also, who owes duties? Um, so, so, fiduciary duties. Well, what, who owes the duties? Does it the general partner and its corporate board? Have the duties been modified or eliminated? Uh, are there controlling limited partners or investors who might exercise outsized influence on the general partner or control the entity? They might end up having some duties. Uh, are there contractual blocking rights? See this more in the LLC context than in the partnership context, but there have been cases where if you are an LLC or sorry, a member of an LLC, you exercise minority protection, you know, express granted rights under the LLC agreement. Uh, that can, um, you know, by exercising that right in bad faith manner. So in the, in the case I'm thinking of, the, they withheld their consent. Sent their company into bankruptcy for you know, additional financing, and then bought out the assets of the company in bankruptcy at a fire sale price. The court found that was a breach of, of its duty. Um, so it's a tricky situation because you still have you don't have to bond short, you still have your trust rights, but when you do them in a way that 
you know, they weren't being asked to loan the money to facilitate the money and so forth. So, anyways, I, again, the modification of fiduciary duties did one thing, you know, I mentioned earlier. So, a lot of times you're not seeing a wholesale modification or elimination of fiduciary duty because the markets aren't going to support that. Investors aren't going to invest in that. What you will see instead is what, what I call a sole discretion language, where you'll have a modification that'll say, in any place in the partnership agreement where they use the word sole discretion or discretion, the general partner or the manager, whatever it is, can exercise its it can exercise those rights in, a, in its own interest. Doesn't have any fiduciary duties. So then you you look at targeted places in the partnership agreement where sole discretion is used, and that's where the modification of fiduciary duties can take effect. So that's kind of the middle ground that you see a lot of times in these fund agreements. Uh, just a few other things. Implied covenant is a difficult. So those those are claims that you might bring uh, as gap filler, or if they're arbitrarily re using their um, uh, exercise of discretion. Uh, but again, that's a that's a tough one, and you can't eliminate the implied contractual covenant, good faith and fair dealing in Delaware. So those apply to these partnership and operating agreements. And finally, derivative actions. Uh, you know. Similar to what Helen was talking about, uh, there's a statutory right for uh, members, limited partners, and assinees to bring derivative actions to cause the partnership to sue on behalf of the partnership. Uh, in those cases, you have to do similar to what you do in federal corporation demand utility, essentially show why either you make petition to the general partner, the controller, manager to, to file suit or take action or why it makes sense that you would have been futile to make that And then I'm just on dissolution. So Delaware is a little different than the Cayman Islands. Dissolution is, uh, there's, there's no filing. You don't have a right to, to cause dissolution. Uh, there are certain steps for events, including, um, you know, it's consent of all the general partners and limited partners who own more than two thirds. Bank current percentage or other interest in the profits of the production. That's fine. You have that statutory right, but if you can't get all the general partners, or if you're fighting with the general partner, you may not be able to cause the solution. A uh, little bit easier, maybe in LLCs, if you can get enough other members, uh, you know, two thirds, and it's not been overridden by the partnership agreement, then you might have an ability to cause the solution. Or you can petition for judicial dissolution. Again, this may be difficult in a fund context where. You have to show that um, that it's not reasonably practical to carry on the business in conformity with the partnership without breaking. That typically you see that in a 50 50 joint venture or in a situation where there's limited investors versus a fund where you might have a, a lot of people. Now, look, if there's a deadlock or some kind of dispute that's not allowing the fund to, to continue to operate, then, then maybe you might be able to meet that standard. Um, and then exit rights, you know. The only thing I'll say about exit rights is you don't have any exit rights in you know, a Delaware partnership or LLC unless you provide a form of the agreements themselves. So again, contract is key, and if you take nothing else from this presentation, contract is key. Uh, you can do a lot of things in those, those agreements, so you really have to be aware of what's going on in those agreements to understand what rights your investor may or may not have. Um, and I think with that, Talked a little bit about the SEC and, and that overlay of the federal law. Um, but again, you know, dissolution is a, is a, tough, a tough situation at the end. Or it's, it's not easy to, to just petition for dis, dis, dissolution, you know, unlike the Cayman Islands, where I think you have a little more flexibility or the investor kind of right to do that. In the meantime, I figured out how to use this one. So. <laughs> okay. We have uh, two minutes. We have a little bit more time than that. Two minutes. I know. We can start late. You have to explain the <laughs> applications we have as we invest. And so far, um, Helen and Michael explained how. Uh, what kind of roles are involved in uh, pursuing 
claims or possible number of rights against the manager of state. So I will just give some sort of idea to you. So who would like to share some thoughts with you? In case the investor is a Korean investor, then what kind of complications do we have? I will just add this to you. I'm the investor. When I come along, I have my retail investors to them. I'm the SMA. So like this. It, you know, in Korea, it is very rare for the retail investors to have direct relationship with either Cayman ERP or Delaware or LT. They, they would make the investment through an entity called Asset Management, Asset Management Company. It is a regulated financial institution. So, the, although it is an investment in offshore entity funds like a Cayman ELP, the limited partnership or the, you know, or the interest to such as a position of the LP would be solve the investment, a part of or, you know, a management of the investment assets for the individual retail investors. So they form, asset managers form kind of fund and they sell the fund products to the retail investors. And in that position, they owe fiduciary duties to their uh, customer clients who are the retail investors. So on, on, on the one hand, between asset manager and offshore funds like uh, Cayman ELP, the asset manager, the Korean financial institution, is an investor. But with, uh, between the retail investor, who is the real source of the fund, investment fund, and the uh, Korean asset manager company, it is an asset manager or Fiduciary duty to retail investors. So, what does this mean? Okay. They owe to the retail investors. It, it, it covers three aspects. So, at the time, they should select the right product for their retail investors. If at the investment stage, if they have selected a wrong product, namely under the uh, contracts for corporate documents, Ellen and Michael explained, if it has power in obtaining information or you know, managing a such risk from such products, or the pursuing liabilities of the GPs or recovery actions, dissolutions, then it's a wrong product. If the asset manager still selected such product or sale to their uh, end client, then they own liabilities to them. So at the investment stage, if Korean asset management company. The investor, unlike the investors in the States or other countries, they should exercise the ability to select the right product. Second, during the lifetime of the fund uh, itself, it should keep obtaining information, it should keep monitoring the performance of investment. Otherwise, or it can be breach of their particular duty to their retail investors. So, you know, if the product itself is 
surgery product that does not provide, that allows the GP or uh, as many investment manager not to provide the information. So as That's not already the source of the And, and you know, uh, at the end of the investment period, if uh, it is, if we encounter a situation where where is my money, then I'm like, it is, you know, in case it is a, um, uh, his own or her own money is. The asset manager, the Korean investor, should do everything to recover the investment. Either it is a claim, lawsuit against the GP, investment manager, or it is a request for any action or resolution on the partnership or the It should do everything. What I would like to uh, just remind you when you um, have a chance to meet with the Korean uh, investor as a manager or the other side, the investor's discretion about what to take, how to manage during the lifetime of the uh, investment and but you do to be very narrow It is because they are not just looking at from one side. They have to turn around and they should be mindful about their legal duties, obligations the people. <coughs> Um, well, thank, thank you. Finally, I, I get to use my, <laughs> our listener. So um, I, I think that was very helpful in um, sort of different levels for litigators. I think uh, you know in these types of offshore bond litigation, like uh, we touched a few tools that will be available to. Um, you and your client in, uh, in, in these situations in Delaware and uh, came in, uh, in terms of not just actual litigation to dissolve the fund or fire the GP, but also ways to force information uh, access into the funds and how it's structured. But also, um, I, I think the theme is, uh, you know, has been that uh, contract matters and uh, it's you know, whether it's, you know, Kevin or uh, the ways to um, sort of opt out of statutory rights um, and, and how the inherent structuring and dynamics between GPs and LPs uh, play into that. I mentioned that uh, in the past, uh, I guess, decade or two, there has been a lot of growth and sophistication on the investor side, like all the big funds and uh, pension funds and other uh, endowments, they have their very, very sophisticated, experienced in-house lawyers, and they have good army of external counsel to help them navigate through. And uh, as part of their investment policy, they are quite conservative in terms of uh, picking their um, you know, investment you know, targets and uh, destinations. But for less sophisticated, uh, newly entering investors or the funds that have not had this level of uh, sort of experience in litigation, it's always difficult for them to actually um, gauge their positioning in the market, whether they are giving up too much, they're not asking for the things that they would uh, otherwise get. Um, so I think it's more of a, um, you know, huge burden and the responsibility for transactional counsel to actually uh, watch out for them and be aggressive for the client. And also for the client, uh, when uh, I was you know, giving this type of lecture uh, somewhere else uh, about how offshore litigation and uh, uh, fund-related investigations and litigation can make clients' life 
truly miserable because they have not only um, you know to distribute to their investors, uh, their, their own investors, retail investors, but also uh, have to an having to answer um, a lot of inquiries coming from the re regulators and prosecutors. Um, and like you know, the the audience was like, okay, like what do we do? And my short answer was spend more time on transactional lawyers so they don't need uh, litigators, right? Once you get into litigation, it's going to be a lot more complicated, a lot more expensive, and a lot more difficult um, to answer questions that would uh, have otherwise not just you know come up or uh, would have been answered with much easier, uh, simple requests or not. So um, you know, I, and and on the flip side, as a transactional lawyers, uh, I think uh, people and lawyers in general, but also. Uh, investors as well, like in-house in and uh, business decision makers, should understand um, like where their money is being spent, not just on investments, but also to protect their rights around the investments and understand the potential uh, ways that they can sort of screw themselves versus protect themselves in uh, how to lay out these uh, contractual. Um, obligations and duties and whatnot. So, uh, like, I think we're almost, I guess, out of time already. But, uh, like, I want to invite any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to just pass the mic on and say, like, if you can pick out one thing that we should remember walking out of this room uh, in terms of, okay, where do I, you know, which provision do I pay attention to? Um, like, generally speaking, I guess. Uh, information access, um, distribution rights, um, like all of that, like what do we have to uh, look out for? So I'll, I'll you know, pass, pass the mic down and then we'll, we'll uh, in, in that time, like we'll see if you guys have any questions. I'll just second the, uh, use the transactional lawyer. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think in addition to the informational and, and I guess um, distribution or redemption, what I call exit rights, the, the other thing I would say is fiduciary duties. What what are they? Have they been modified, especially in Delaware instances? Um, because that's probably going to be one of your clearest ways to bring a suit if there is mismanagement or things that are you know, complex. Any of those types of things that arise, that's your way to do that. My comment is uh, a similar thing. Uh, in, in Cayman, actually, uh, there's a mandatory duty to act in good faith by the general partners. Uh, but when it comes to uh, acting in the best interest of the fund, it's something you can verify by contracts for. Um, so, uh, very similar to the general situation. So sometimes we have seen very elaborate uh, exemption of our liability clauses in LPAs. Like the general partner is not responsible for anything unless there is a fraud or gross negligence. Um, again, the transactional lawyer probably should have removed that for the LPA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's the period for you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, if we want to hold the uh, uh, GP liable or something. Um. So, uh, again, uh, as a lawyer, typically representing Korean investors that uh, invest in Cayman. Uh, the film important from the selection of uh, the product stage, they should really well understand what is our power, what is limited. So, by the Access to the internet, we try to file claims without clearly understanding that this is a product already maintained. So, my firm advice to the investor clients to have the right. Advisor from that position and tell from the stage where it's event. 
Any questions, comments? No? Thank you very much, and uh, sorry for the late start. Thank you.